Let's dive into the Word of God tonight. We are on part six of being led by fire and the benefits of being led by the Spirit of God. The children of Israel, what we're going to see here, the children of Israel have been going through a crisis. They've been going through the plagues uh, as we studied last week. And God is going to literally lead them by His presence. He comes in a cloud of fire by day and and, uh, fire by night. And He is leading them with His presence presence. So as they are walking through these uncertain times, the same God that led the children of Israel out of Egypt's bondage is the same God, can I remind you, is the same God that is leading us and is guiding us. And and if we allow him, he will gladly lead each of us. Amen. So the same God that worked miracles for them wants to work miracles also in you and I. God wants to lead us into all that he has prepared for us. And you've got to know this. God has something prepared for his people. He has an inheritance, the Bible says, for every last one of us. So tonight we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 11. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 12. We're going to look at Exodus chapter 13. And uh, we, we are coming to one of the most significant events in the scriptures. The reason why it is so important, it's not only an account of how God delivered the nation of Israel from uh, slavery and that kind of thing and how that God set them free but it is what theologians call here typology it is a picture of Christ it is a picture of what Christ does for his people their deliverance uh, their release from captivity gives us a picture of what Christ has done and will do for each of us aren't you thankful for the deliverance of Christ in your life Has God ever delivered you from something? Well, you ought to give him praise tonight. Amen. Come on. He's a deliverer, isn't he? He's not only the deliverer from Moses and the people of Israel. He is our deliverer as well. So the Old Testament is giving us a picture of what Christ can and will do for us in our lives. Um, How many know what the word saved in uh, Greek means? Is it's the word sozo? Maybe you've heard that before. Sozo. I told Reed, you know, Reed's in Chicago and planning agape there. I said, Reed, maybe you ought to rethink that. Maybe you should call your church Sozo Church. Sounds like a Chicago term, doesn't it? Sounds a little something that people in Chicago would like. Sozo means God saving the body, the soul, and the spirit. And I'm telling you, isn't that what we need today? I, I mean. The body needs deliverance from things and soul ties and things like that. And what you're going to see is God, he does not only want to save your spirit, he wants your body healed. Amen. That's part of it, body, soul, and spirit. And we're going to see that how God delivers and how God saves. In Exodus chapter 11, I want to give you three pictures tonight. Of the Exodus. And uh, those three pictures are number one is going to be the plagues. It's going to be a picture of judgment. And don't let that scare you tonight. But God is a God of judgment. And we're going to see that. Uh, and, and, And the second thing we're going to see is the Passover. And it is a picture of Jesus. And then we're going to see the pillar of fire, which is a picture of our journey with the Lord. So as we look at Exodus 11, chapter 1, um, chapter 11, verse 1, let's read there. And now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Remember, we just got through uh, talking about the nine plagues, but uh, he still will not let them go. After that... The Bible says he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. And then let's uh, skip down to verse 4. And let's read to verse 8 right there. Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die from the first." born son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the female slave who was at her hand mill and all the firstborn of the cattle as well there will be loud wailing throughout Egypt worse than there has ever been or ever will be again can you imagine such sorrow and grief 
I can't imagine what what, uh, is taking place here. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark at any person or animal. I read that and I read it two or three times and I was like, you know, I got two dogs myself. They bark at their shadow. And he said, dogs are not even going to bark during this time. There's going to be such mourning going on in the land. Then he said, you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these officials of yours will come to me, bowing down before me, saying, go and, and all of the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. Then Moses, hot with anger, left Pharaoh. Now, why did God choose to take the firstborn? Let's look at that because um, many of us can don't understand the judgment of God. And when we look at, many of us don't even like to hear about the judgment of God. I've, I've been around people before that says, you know, I, I don't even like that part uh, of, the, uh, of God, but God is a God of judgment. And we know that the world is coming to judgment if you truly believe the scriptures and we're to be ready for that. So um, why did God choose to take the firstborn? If you go back a few chapters and you go to chapter 4 and you look at verses 22 and 23, it says, Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. If you think about it, all of the nine plagues that led up to this were a a warning of great judgment, of greater judgment that was to come. Uh, And Pharaoh refusing his heart hardened uh, against God. They had many, many, many gods in in, Israel. in Egypt, and if you remember when Moses uh, went to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to him, "Who is this God?" He didn't know who God was, and and what we're seeing here is God is showing not only the Egyptians because Israel has never seen this before; they've never gone through plagues like this, and they and the miracles that they are seeing here, uh, they are understanding that God is a God of judgment as well. See, not only would this judgment fall upon Egypt, it was very possible that this judgment would fall upon Israel as well. So Moses knew it was very possible for this plague to potentially kill the firstborn of Israel as well. So Moses does this in Exodus 12, verses 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. You're going to see this phrase right here, Passover lamb, over and over again. Uh, He said, take a bunch of hyssop, which is a a bush-like plant. He He said, take this plant, dip it in blood in basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians... He will see the blood on top and sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit, listen at this, he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Amen. If Israel does not slaughter the lamb, if if they do not put blood on the doorposts, on the tops and on the sides, signifying what? That they are covered by the blood. If they do not do this, their firstborn also would die. In order to escape judgment, listen to this, there had to be the shedding of blood. This is so important right here. This is the picture that we're seeing. This is a picture of Jesus Christ and his work on the cross for us. Think about Hebrews 9, 22 when Paul says, In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, you don't get forgiveness of your sin. Somebody ought to stop right here and say, Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your precious blood. 
I mean, we're getting ready to go into Easter not too long here. And it is so important that we understand what we're looking at here is a picture and a type of Christ. It's important for the people also to understand, uh, for us all to understand that just being a good person is not good enough. The Bible says all of us have sinned. Come on, somebody. No rock, no rock tossing in here, right? Come on, we all have, some of y'all sin today. Hello. You know, uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need to be compassionate towards sinners, don't we? We all want them covered by the blood of Christ. So the blood has to be applied to our sins. Attending church and church membership does not forgive or remove any of our sins. None of those things uh, are forgiven just because you've got money or you've got status. Uh, thank God you just can't buy your way into heaven. If that was the case, some of us couldn't go, could we? There had to be the shedding of blood is what we're seeing here. Hebrews 9, 27 says this, And as it is appointed for man to die once, but after that, what does he say? There's judgment. It's important that everyone understands that there is coming a day when we too will face a judgment unless we allow the blood of the spotless lamb to cover our lives and the doorpost of our hearts. The, listen, the, the book of Revelation is very clear. There is a record that is being kept. And can I say this? His records are better than our records. His records keep a record of everything we've done. And, 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 and mm. what if our record was on the big screen to just scroll through? I mean, we wouldn't want that, would we? But can I tell you, Jesus let us know that when the blood has been applied to our sins, there is no more record of that sin. Amen. It has been completely removed, and it's not remembered against you any longer. Thank God for that, right? Thank God for that. So Moses knew their sin had to be covered or they would face judgment. So in the same way, think about it. Here's a picture on top. Our sins have to be covered as well or we will face judgment for our sin. Once our sin is covered, what does it do? It opens the door for us to the, the manifold blessings of God, to the wonderful goodness of God. God wants to bless every last one of you. I like to say it like this. He wants wants to bless your socks off. That's a good South Georgia term, isn't it? I don't think that translates uh, Latin-wise, but uh, God wants to bless you real good like that. And uh, it's wonderful to know that we don't have to walk around in guilt and shame anymore. I know that the enemy tries to remind us all of things that we've done in our past. But can I tell you, it's not remembered against you. Go ahead and let it go as well. Because the blood of Christ has covered it. There may be some people in your life where they may... Uh, bring up your past or they may remember what you've done but Christ will never hold it against you any longer amen for whom the son has set free they are free indeed there is no more shackles no more chains there is complete deliverance in Christ because we have been covered by the blood of the lamb can I tell you what don't go around reminding people of their sin go around and remind people of of what a great God we have who delivers us from our sins. Amen. Once the sin has been covered, it's going to open the door to a whole new experience. So what we see here is there is a picture of judgment, and judgment is coming upon the world. We see that in, in the book of Revelation. As many of you have already studied uh, the book of Revelation, we've studied here in the church, and our ladies' ministry has always had, had that study. I think they went through it three or four or five times. I mean, it's amazing because you're always getting something new about God, a revelation of the Lord. But let's look at the second picture tonight. And the second picture is the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb is a picture of Jesus right here. This event shows us what Jesus would do. Exodus 12, 3 
verse 6, it says, Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Verse 6 says, Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month. Then all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at, at twilight. I, I, I just want you to think about this with me. Uh, can you imagine having that little lamb in your house for days and weeks? Days and weeks, and your kids, you get attached to it. Things like that, and your kids are asking, why does it have to die? Why does this have to die? That sacrifice, can you think about it, will bring sorrow, and it, it, it brings some sadness to that household, an understanding that there is a loss of life to cover your sin, right? So notice what Exodus 12, 5 says here. The animals you choose, they must be one-year-old males without defect and and I want you to think about Jesus was the perfect lamb Jesus in him there are no defects in him right he who knew no sin the Bible says was willing to become sin for us Exodus 12 says this in in verse 12 on that same night he says I'm going to pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals and I will bring judgment, notice this, on all the gods of Egypt. Remember, we talked about how Egypt w w believed in all these different kinds of God. Even one of the plagues that was brought upon them with the frogs, remember that the frogs was in their bed, the frogs was in their pantry, in their wherever they went. Frogs were everywhere. They were not to kill a frog, but yet you couldn't take a step without stepping on a frog. God was letting them know that these frogs don't mean anything. They're not gods to be worshipped. He said, all of these gods of Egypt, he said, I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And even today, this is why the Jewish feast is called the Passover. Why? Because they remember what God did for them that night. Judgment passed over them because there was blood applied to their doorpost. And when you and I apply the blood of Christ to the doorpost of our lives, I believe that judgment just passes right over us. Why? Uh, because the precious blood of Christ is a covering and protection. Amen? No, it, it goes to finish up in that verse. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Whenever the people of Israel understood or whatever they understood about Christ, or, or God, whatever they understood. They, they were getting to know a God that they did not know, that they heard of. If they understood his ways or they didn't understand his ways, they were building a trust with him. Can I tell you tonight, you know what you're building with God in your life? You're building a trust. That God, I don't always understand your ways. I don't. I don't understand. But I know this, that the Bible lets us know his ways are higher. God knows what he is doing. And that God is totally, do we still believe that today? That, that God is totally in control and he knows exactly what he's doing. So uh, it, when you think about it, what what was going on here this wasn't about money it wasn't about being good enough it wasn't about education it was about following the principles of a loving God that desire to have a fellowship with man and what he was letting you know there's nothing going to stand in my way from having fellowship with my people I love that about God. God says, I'm not going to let nothing get in the way of me having fellowship with you. And if it's sin, it's going to be covered by the blood of Christ because I want to have fellowship with you. And he is a God. The Bible says he is a jealous God. Do you realize you were created for God and for God alone? 
You were not created for Buddha, Muhammad, and all these other gods and things that, that the world is just searching for. You were created for God and his purposes alone. And if you will allow him tonight, I promise you, he will begin to lead you and guide you. He will help you. He will be with you. And there will be nothing that can stand in between that relationship between you and him. Amen. Because when he sees the blood, you know what he says? I got relationship with you. We blood, baby. We blood like that. Aren't you thankful for blood like that? Amen. You got a, you got a high priest. You got a brother in Christ. You got a friend in God. A friend that sticketh even closer than your natural brother. He's not going to let nothing get in between you and the friendship you have because of the blood of his precious son. I love that about the Lord tonight. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our downfalls, and yet he loves us like that. And because Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice, you don't have to worry about your sin any longer. Past, you can wave at it, bye-bye past, present, or future. He knows you don't always have it all together. I know you look like you do. I mean, and he knows that about us. But he also took into account that the blood of Jesus Christ is stronger than any failure in your life. Amen. I, I'm telling y'all, it's hard. It's hard for people, I believe, to backslide when the blood is so strong. You're going to have to come kicking and dragging through the blood of Christ. Amen. The blood is just as strong. Only by the blood of the spotless lamb could we ever escape the judgment that is coming upon this earth. That is the picture of what Christ did for us. I love what John the Baptist did. Uh, John 1.29, uh, the Bible says, and the next day, John saw Jesus. He was coming from a distance. And there, he's like, look, everybody, turn your head and look. Look, there comes the Lamb of God. He didn't say Jesus, did he? He said the Lamb right there. Why? He knew he was going to be the sacrifice. There comes the Lamb of God. And guess what the Lamb of God is going to do? He's going to take away your sin, your sin, your sin, your sin. There comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin sins of the world. Anybody excited about your sin being taken away like that? Amen. You and I can't take away our own sin. Only Jesus can do that. Jesus did for us what we can never do for ourselves. John 1, 3, 35, and the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples when he saw Jesus passing by, and he said, y'all look. Y'all look right there. That's the Lamb of God. That's the bomb right there. That's the man, that's the lamb of God right there that takes away the sins of the earth, the world right there. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, he said, for Christ, he said what? He is our Passover lamb. See, we see in that picture, even in, ex, in Exodus here, Christ is a Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Christ is a picture of the Passover lamb. 1 Peter 1, 18 says this, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as money, silver, gold, those kinds of things, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Thank you, Daddy. What is he saying? No amount of money can buy your salvation. No amount of good works can get you into heaven. Not even just being a good person, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Just like the Passover lamb, it had to be spotless. It had to be without defect because it was a picture of Christ. Because many of you have probably read through the Old Testament and you have read through that. Why did it have to be a lamb? Because Jesus was going to be the lamb of God that takes away the sin, right? And why did it have to be a perfect one? Why couldn't we just hand off the defective one? Because Jesus is going to be a picture and a type of Christ. He had no defects. 
So as Jesus stood before Pontius, uh, Pontius Pilate, you remember uh, five times, five different times, he says, I find no fault in him. I cannot find a defect in him. I've looked and I've looked and I've looked and I've told you once, I've told you twice, i told you three times. My Lord, I've even told you five times. There's no fault in this man. They could not find fault in him. They could not find a defect in him. He is the spotless lamb. On 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that evening sacrifice, he is hanging on the cross and he cries out, It is finished. Your sin, my sin, everyone's sin. He laid it out on the cross for us. He became the spotless lamb that took away the sins of the earth. Amen. Well, I can wash away my sin. Y'all know the song? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. I'm taking y'all back to Sunday school. <laughs> he is the Passover lamb. You see that picture this evening. I love John chapter 1 verse 7. It says, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin you will see the lamb as symbolic of christ in scripture revelation 5 6 then i saw the lamb looking as if he had been slain standing in the center of the throne revelation 5 and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll, to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and every language and people and nation. Revelation 5 and 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice, what, of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times 10,000. Somebody say that's a lot of people. That's a lot of folks, isn't it? They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they were saying. What were they saying? Worthy is the what? The lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor glory and praise revelation 5 13 to him who sits on the throne and unto what the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever this is why this book of exodus is so important it is a picture of the coming christ it is a picture of, of christ being slain from the foundation of the earth right for our sin, we will see and worship the Lamb one day. We will bow before him, the one who take a, took away all of our sins and all of our transgressions. For some of us, we're going to be there a long time. We had a lot of sin, didn't we? We had a lot of transgressions. And because of the Lamb of God, we will not suffer eternal judgment. He will look at you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Welcome into heaven. Wow. Exodus 12, verse 29. We go back here and it says, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt and from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night. There was a loud wailing in Egypt. And there was not a house without someone dead. We may not know how to appreciate what is taking place here. But that is the, what you see here is the thoroughness of God here at, in judgment. God's very thorough. Understand, there's coming a judgment upon the earth again. Revelation gives us a glimpse into it. And just like the plagues in Revelation, we see that it gets more severe and more severe. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds. As you have said, and go, and also, notice what he says. 
and bless me. Pharaoh is saying, there's something about your God. And he said, Lord, bless me. And let's answer that phone. <laughs> bless me. He knew there was a God in Egypt. The Egyptians urged, uh, Egyptians urged the people to hurry and to leave the country. Uh, I'm ready for y'all to get out of here, they're saying. Otherwise, they said, we all are going to die. You're going to see three pictures here. You see the plagues, a picture of judgment, the Passover, lamb, a picture of Jesus. And as we get ready to close tonight, you're going to see the pillar of fire is a picture of our journey. It's midnight. Think about this with me if you can visualize, visualize this with me. It's in the middle of the night and the people are leaving Egypt after all the ten plagues. And as you can imagine, it's very, very dark. There's no street lights there to guide them. You have this very large group of people making their way out of Egypt. Having come under the blood of the Lamb, they have been redeemed. They have been set free. And now God goes before them in this pillar of fire and then a cloud by day. And what a beautiful picture of God going before them and God lighting up their way. This is what God wants to do for his people. This is what God wants to do in your life. He wants to go before you. He wants to light up the pathway. So God leads us and he guides us on the journey. Exodus 13 verse 21. By day the Lord went ahead of them and in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And, and by night a pillar of fire to give them light. So that they could travel by day. This is important for them. So that they could travel by day or they could travel by night. Guess why many people don't want to get out at night. They say, well, I can't see, as, can't see good. But God is saying here, my people can travel by day or by night because I'm going to light up the path for you. Whew. Come on, God is speaking to us tonight. He's like saying, if you allow me, I'm going to light the path up for you. You're going to know where to go, what to do. This is going to be absolutely essential for every last one of them as they are fleeing Egypt at night. As you will see uh, next week, Pharaoh is going to chase after them, uh, chase them down and, and try to harm them. Uh, they'll, and, and they're going to need to be able to travel at night. They're going to be able to, tr uh, to travel some during the day. They're, and think about this. They're in the middle of the desert. It's hot. So they can't travel all day long in that kind of heat. They're going to need to be able to travel by night. And the Bible says in verse 22, Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the fire by night left its place in front of the people. Think of all the benefits now of a, a, a cloud by day and a fire by night. And that represents what? The very presence of God. One of those things is guidance. Somebody say guidance. In other words, they're going to be led by God. They are fleeing. God is going before them. Can you imagine what they are experiencing? They're trying to wrap their head around everything that's going on. They've been slaves. Think about this, guys. 400 years. 400 years of slavery. And in a moment, I know, and, and they're going through all the different plagues that they went through, and then, then this last plague that they went through, and in the middle of the night, saying, you got to get out of here. you got to go. Well, where are we going to go? Well, can you imagine how chaotic it seemed for them to pack up and leave? Not only did they pack up and leave, you remember they had to give up. The, 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 they went from door to door, and they gave up their gold and their silver. Hey, listen, if you, if you got uh, uh, Neiman Marcus in you, in your closet, they had to give up their Neiman Marcus. They gave it up. Oh, I like those pots and pans. Oh, you can have them. Just go. That kind of thing. So they're taking all of this with them. So they're trying to get their mind. Can you imagine trying to lead such a large group of people? Having to mouth out a plan uh, would take a long time to create such a plan. Just a 
food plant along for all of these people to organize. And then you got to execute it. But I love this about God. God already had a plan. That's what somebody needs to know tonight. God's already already planned it all out for you. And he's going to execute the plan. He knows he's going before you. He's going to guide you. He's going to lead you. God has already organized. Some of y'all are not good organizers. But God is a wonderful organizer. And he's going to go before you. He's going to organize every last detail. He is going to lead you. And think about this. They are being led by Almighty God. In the darkest night, they are being led by God. I want to remind you, in the darkest of your night, God is leading you. You may not see the way. You may not know what to do, but God is there leading the way, lighting up the pathway. And get this, God already knows the path and the journey you need to take. I love that about God. I don't always know it, but he knows it, right? In the day, think about the daytime. Yeah, they could see things more clearer by day, but God clearly saw the bigger picture. He knew, like, I know where I want to take you. Nehemiah 9, 12. I love this. Nehemiah spoke of God's people being guided by God. He said, he reminded God, by day you led them with a, a pillar of cloud. And by night, you gave them a pillar of fire to give them and to light on the way of where they should take. What Nehemiah was saying, you remember when the wall burned down in Jerusalem and Nehemiah had the passion to go and build the wall back around Jerusalem? He's like, God, I don't know how to get the resources. I don't know what to do. What he was acknowledging is the same God that led them. You're the same God. It's going to lead me. Could I tell somebody tonight, the same God that led the crowd. Nehemiah is the same God is saying that can lead the individual. God, how many can say, God, I need to hear from you. God, I need you to lead me. I love Psalms 37. The steps of a man are established by the Lord and he delights in his way. Psalms 25, who is the man who fears the Lord? What is he saying? He said, God's going to instruct him in the path that he has chosen for him. God guiding you. What a bit of beautiful picture here. That's what it means to be led by fire. The Lord going before you. Not just God in the big events of your life leading you. God, I got this job changer. Or God, should I marry this person? Or God, should I move to another city? God, what do you want me to do? You know, how about God in the little things of life too? He wants to lead you in those little decisions as well. The second benefit is the provision. God's going to provide. Exodus 12, 37. The Israelites journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth. There were about 600,000 men on foot. Y'all, we put some numbers to this now. Besides men, besides the men and the women, there was, besides women and children, scholars suggest that there could have been up to 2 million people. Oh, my word. Could you imagine having to cook, Miss Ronnie, for all that group? Listen to this. i got some numbers for you. It would have required 4 million pounds of food per day to feed them. That is a, a three freight trains a mile long. They would need 11 million gallons of water per day. That would be a freight train with 334 tankers of water. And God sustained them. God provided for them. God was their provider. And he is going to look after all of their needs. And I have to stop and say, my God, what a miracle. What a God. And if he needed to bring water out of a rock, he'd do it. Whatever they, if they needed meat, they needed, he would send them quail. 
He was a God of miracles. We sing that song around here. He is the God of miracles. And I want to remind us tonight to everybody that's watching, He is still a God of miracles. And He is still a God that's guiding. He is still a God that is providing for His people. Don't you be afraid to ask God. He's going to do it. I said he's going to do it. He's going to provide. The last thing as we close tonight, he is the protector. He was going to be their protection that they desperately needed because they had an enemy. Can I tell you, you have an enemy? Can I tell you, you need divine protection as well? We have an adversary. We have an enemy as well. We're going to see more clearly in our next study about this enemy. The Bible says in Exodus 14, and Pharaoh approached the Israelites. The Israelites, uh, they looked up, and there were Egyptians. That was their enemy. And they were marching after them, and they were terrified. And guess what they did? They cried out to God. God, i got to have you. Exodus 14, then the angel of, of God. And by the way, Jesus is the angel of God. Right here. This is what we're seeing, the incarnate Christ. Jesus is the angel of God who had been traveling, listen, in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. I love this part of the scripture here. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them. Coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. We're going to see this next week. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. I'm going to tell you, God's just the protector, isn't he? That he won't let the enemy get next to you. Notice throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. What is this? This is God's divine protection. And I want to say it like this. Would you just stand with me all over the building tonight as we get ready to close here? Somebody say, he's a 24-7 God. And he's better than ADT. Yes, he is. He knows how to watch over us. He knows how to protect us. So Jesus, I love this because this is Jesus watching over and protecting them. Somebody say this with me tonight as we get ready to go. Jesus, thank you for watching over me and protecting me. He protected you when you didn't even know he was protecting you. He was going before you and guiding you. He guided you here tonight. Why? Because he wants to have fellowship with you. He wants to reveal himself to you more and more and more. Because listen, here we are thinking tonight, well, I'm going to be going in this direction. And God's, God's thinking, I know you think you're going to be going that direction, but I got another direction for you. That's God right there. Some of you are in Statesboro tonight because God led you to Statesboro. And God is working in your life and God is talking to you and, and God brought you to exactly the place that he wants you in your life. You've been struggling. You've been hurting. You've been needing God to speak to you. You've been wanting an encounter with God. And God said, I know where I want to take you. I know what I want to do in your life. And God brought you here. Sunday night, God brought a precious family in this house. And God did a mighty deliverance right here in this room through, the, through that night of prayer. Can I tell you this? God is still leading us. God is still delivering us. God is still speaking to us. God is still guiding us. He is a 24-7 God. Let's close as we read Isaiah 41.10 together. The last scripture, let's read it together. All right. Last one, Isaiah 41.10. Y'all ready? I want y'all to let the Lord hear you. More than that, I, I, I want the devil to hear you tonight. I want you to tell him I am not afraid because I got someone guiding me. Woo. Y'all going to make this preacher 
get too excited right by himself on a Wednesday night ain't right, is it? I got a God guiding me. I got a God who is protecting me. I got a God who is pro uh, with me and, and never going to leave me. That's Jesus right there. Y'all ready to do this on three? One, two, three. Fear not, for I am. Be not. Strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Woo, I love that about our God. He's like, I don't want my children afraid. And I don't want them afraid of me. Amen. Let the Lord tonight just touch you with that. And, and let, I pray that you'll just rest in that peace that passes understanding tonight. Anybody going to receive that? Lord, I thank you for your presence. On a Wednesday night, you're still God. On a Wednesday night, Lord, your presence is right here. You are that cloud by day. You've been with us all day long. And God, you are that fire tonight that lights the way for my hungry soul. You're that fire tonight that is leading me, Lord. And, and, and sometimes I don't even know where I'm going, God. But I just know this, God, I'm being led by your spirit. And Lord Jesus, I thank you tonight for that supernatural, uh, those benefits of guidance in my life. I, I'm not God by some spirit that I don't understand or know. I'm guided by the Holy Spirit. I'm not guided by the spirits of this world and this culture. I am guided by the Spirit of Almighty God. And not only that, God, every provision, everything that is needed, my God shall supply all of my needs according to your riches. I'm protected. Somebody say, I'm protected. Don't fear. You are our divine protector. And tonight... Lord, I thank you we're protected from COVID. I thank you, Lord God, that this curse be lifted, this plague be lifted off of our nation. I pray, Almighty God, that the oppression and the depression and, and everything that's come against the minds and the hearts of the people will be lifted off of them as well. And God, I thank you for true freedom. I thank you, Lord, for the freedom, Lord Jesus, and the deliverance that you are giving your people tonight. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, for your abiding presence in this house tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Can we give the Lord praise now? Hallelujah.